Okay, um, so just quickly, um, last class, when did I say homework assignments were always going to be due? Anybody? When are homework assignments always due? Yep, at 11.59 p.m. on what day? The day before class. The day before class, right? So how come I only got as a submission from one of you yesterday? Pardon? Oh, you've been busy. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Look, like, I know you all have other classes. I know you all have other things going on in your lives, right? That doesn't mean that you can just, you know, pretend that other classes don't exist, right? Look, I know that, you know, that most of you in this classroom are nursing students, and you probably don't see how this applies to your future careers. Um, but let's be honest, right? You're frequently going to have to interpret maybe sometimes confusing written directions, right? You are also often going to have to try to figure out what to do in the absence of clear directions, right? You might have to do something to take care of a patient at a time when there is not a doctor there to tell you what to do, right? So it is important to learn to follow processes and follow directions, right? If nothing else. So <clears throat> I honestly, at this point, I, I don't care why it didn't get done, right? Going forward, it's got to get done, right? Each assignment is designed to teach you particular skills that you're going to use, not just in this class, but in other classes going forward, right? Not just in English classes. This is why everybody has to take this class. And I get that nobody chose this class, right? Nobody signs up for Comp 2. You get signed up for it. It's one of the state requirements. But what happens if you don't get at least a C in this class? You got to take it again, yeah. So at the very least, if you don't want to have to take this again, right, make sure you're getting everything done. So <clears throat> by tomorrow at midnight, right, read chapter six in writing analytically, do exercise 6.1. It's going to be about taking a paragraph and separating claims from evidence. We're going to talk about the difference between claim and evidence today. And I'll give you all a sample paragraph to examine and pick apart, right? And you're going to do assignment one on page 176. So you're going to locate on TV, in music, in conversation, in something you read, whatever. You're going to locate three enthymemes and explain what the missing premise is in each. I will explain to you today what an enthymeme is, and we'll do some practice with it, OK? All right, so does anybody have any questions? Is anything at all unclear? Because if, you know, if something is unclear, then you know, I, I honestly do, I wanna know and I wanna help, right? I don't wanna starting the, I don't wanna starting the semester off on the wrong foot. And I want to reiterate, too, that if you need help with your assignments, if you're having trouble, right, please just come and talk to me. Right? I'm happy to help. What I don't like is when people just go quiet and don't, don't do anything, right? OK. Um, so let's get back to where we finished up uh, last time. So if you could take out the work you were doing last time, the free rights from last time on the Mayflower Conference. Let's just do a little bit of work with this, and then we'll get into the claim and evidence stuff. OK, so what did you all write about this last time? Anybody willing to start? Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, you can. So within this excerpt, they are right about the dirty things that they are taking to Virginia to plant the first covenant in Virginia. They mm -hmm. spoke about being mutual in the decision making of this and how they are serving their beloved king. They spoke about coming together as one well to better their ordering, their ordering, preservation, and, and furtherance of, to the end. Basically saying that they came together before their king to push through until they have reached their goal. They talked about what it takes in order to meet the to in order to meet the convenience for the general good of the common. When they okay. stated things such as constitute, frame, ordinance, and and, and constitutions, it made me think of them working towards making a working form of government for their country. A stranger okay. came to know this was submission and obedience. Both of these terms in some sort of way refers to you giving away power or you not being in control of Okay, so you I think you kind of picked up, I think, two interesting strand, strands here that you could play with, right? So one, you know, has to do like these this language, you know, mutual covenant, right? Um, unity, right? So what do you notice about like those words, that kind of language that you picked up? What is it stressing? Mutual, covenant, unity. Okay, yeah, good, right, yeah. So there's this strand that's focused on agreement, right? And, and togetherness, right? Everybody getting on the same page. Now you picked up another strand too there that was kind of at the end of your writing that I think might be even more interesting. And what was that other strand focused on? If you look at your own work there. Yeah, there's this. There's also this strand of yeah, like of submission and obedience, right? So let's see if we could kind of push that a little bit further, right? Who are they claiming obedience to? So on the one hand, you know, they're forming this society together, right? But in doing so. Who are they agreeing to submit to? And I think there are two correct answers here. Okay, on the one hand, the king, right? Who in 1620 was James I. And what other authority are they citing here? Yeah, and also submission to God, right? So, um... I have no idea how good your American history education was in high school, um, but what, if anything, do you all know about the Plymouth colonists, you know, those, the early New England colonists, about their reasons for coming to North America? Or, yeah, Ariel. Um, it was mostly to, like, one of the reasons was to start a new land, like a new colony, but mostly yeah. they wanted to spread their religion as well. But, well that was one of the reasons. Yeah. So the, yeah. So the, the, there was a uh, yeah. There there was uh, an economic reason. Or, yeah. It was it was a, a corporation that was intended to make money. Uh, but yeah, they were all. There was also a religious freedom element to this, right? Um, that the <coughs> Plymouth colonists belonged to a group called the you know called Puritans, who did not um, worship kind of in the mainstream of the Church of England, right? So the head of the Church of England is the king, right? The Church of England is part of the, was part of the state. So there's a kind of interesting tension here in that they're um, agreeing to submit to this monarch who they don't acknowledge as head of the church. But why do you think it matters that they're submitting to James and to God then? What might that indicate? Are you talking about 
talking in terms of government or like? Yeah, in terms well, in terms of both. Well, King James was kind of like the head of the church, mm -hmm. so therefore, like he was also part of the government. So therefore, yeah. it actually him the most. Mm -hmm. So having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, right? Do they seem to be treating that as the same thing? Sort of. Okay, well, uh, how, how, in what way sort of? Think about it. So they got this list of clauses here, right? That are the reasons for coming, right? There's the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith, the honor of king and country. When we look at the way these are kind of put together, kind of listed as three separate clauses in a row, right? Why do you think they do it that way instead of kind of maybe combining the ideas uh, more closely? What's first? Yeah, glory of God comes first, number one, right? So what does that tell us about the way they're ranking things in order of importance? Religious or religion? First? Yeah. That that comes first, right? Yeah, the, for them, the glory of God, right, obedience to God, comes before anything else, right? And then what's next? What's that? Well, is the king next, or is there something in between? Yeah, advancement of the Christian faith, right? So how is that a different thing from the glory of God? Yeah, it is a different thing, right? You're going from something that just kind of is, right, to something that people actually do, right? So you're moving from a, you know, a, a thing that is to action, right, to human action. And then what's number three here in the list? Yeah, king and country is number three concern, right? So that doesn't mean that it's not important, right? But are they putting it on the same level as glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith? Not quite, right? And I think that that, had, you know, that you know, can be maybe traced back to their religious differences with the king, right? But at the same time, what the fact that they're referencing the king at all here, right? That they're urging submission to the king. What does that suggest about the way they think of themselves? Do they still think of themselves as British? Or do they think of themselves as something else now? Yeah, yeah, clearly they, they, they still think of themselves as being subjects of the English king, right? So this is written by people who have left England, right? But still see themselves as English and are still maintaining that legal and cultural connection to the place they came from, right? 
So, you know, we're not seeing as we will, you know, by the end of the 18th century after the American Revolution, right, this kind of establishment of a kind of separate identity as Americans. These are not people who think of themselves as Americans or who think of themselves as anything other than English, right? All right, so what the, uh, what the rest of you write about this? Who else wants to, to is willing to share what they wrote? Yeah, Colby, go ahead. I'm just more to just strain two that we have over there. Uh, mm -hmm. The Mayflower Compact written after the Pilgrims landed in Virginia was a constitution that held the uh, Pilgrims with certain laws. The compact served as a basis for many constitutions today. Uh, this segment acknowledges that the reason the colonists have landed in part to further the kingdom of God and to serve King James. They also mentioned the advancement of the Christian faith likely targeting Native Americans to convert them into Christians. They also mentioned the uh, better, ordering for, better ordering, preservation, and furtherance of the law. The authors are expressing their Christian beliefs in order to keep the civilized, in order to keep civilized laws in their Christian colony. The use of language that is faith-based proves this. They also bow down to the king a lot in the document going so far to call themselves submissive and obedient. Okay, cool. So um, two things I noticed here. So one thing you picked up on here, right, is that they call the place they intend, the, the place they've landed, Virginia. Now, is the place where the Plymouth colonists landed the same place we call Virginia? No. Now, where, where did they land? Yeah, they landed in what's now Massachusetts, right? But the fact that they call the colony the northern part of Virginia tells us what? They got lost on the way. <laughs> okay, yeah, they, they actually were aiming for what is now Virginia, right? But they, yeah, the bad weather blew them off course. Um, but yeah, but that, um, their concept of North America, right, was based on where other British colonies were already located, right? So Virginia is the earlier colony. So they just think of that whole east coast of the United States as Virginia, right? The whole east coast of what is now the United States, right? In 1620, that didn't exist yet. So, um, the other thing here, like, so you're talking a little bit about um, the kinds of laws that they're making for themselves, right? So does this sound like they're just going to follow English law, or does it sound like they want to do something different? They're going to make their own laws. Yeah, they're going to make their own laws, right? You know, with due submission to the king, right? But, you know, the king's, yeah, king's in London, right? King's not watching, you know, the king's not looking over your shoulder, watching what you're doing, right? So what do they say about the laws they intend to make here? How do they describe the laws they intend to enact in their new colony? Just and equal. Yeah, okay, let's try to put a little pressure on that then, right? I think we can link this up with that language of mutuality and agreement that Michaela noted, right? If they're going to make together in agreement with each other just and equal laws here in their new colony, what does that suggest they think of the laws that were on the books in the place they just left? Yeah that English law was not just an equal, right? And we can probably also, like in terms of context here, right, we can think of this in terms of their religious dispute with the king, right? So how much, if anything, do you all know about Puritans or Puritanism and how it operated? They were basically 
basically a cult. <laughs> that, that is how, that would have been how the king saw them. Yes, they were a very uh, conservative. For the time, they were extremely conservative, and the king's laws were actually too liberal to them. I, I guess it probably depends on how you define conservative and liberal, right? I guess uh, at this point, uh, Puritans were more Bible focused, mm -hmm. and uh, the English church was more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yes. Yeah, so, so I think like the the the, pil the the pilgrims and Puritans would have been like what we would think of as kind of socially conservative, right? But politically, they were pretty radical. And politically, they they wanted to run their communities, including their church, democratically, which was not the way the Church of England was run, right? Where you know everybody from your local priest up to bishops were basically government appointees, or they were appointed by the king or by the local lord. So this dispute between about the way a church should be run comes into the way they describe the laws that they want to make, even while insisting on maintaining the relationship with England and with the king, right? Okay, yeah, we submit to the king, right? But while we're here, in our own little profit-making farming enterprise, we are going to make laws that strike us as just and equal, right? That aren't kind of status conscious like the laws are in England. All right, but you guys are actually, and you guys are using these free rights actually to be, you may not realize it immediately, but you're actually picking up on some interesting stuff here that can be developed, right? Um, so what about the rest of you? What, what did the rest of you write? Yeah, Eric, go ahead. So I first cited a uh, sentence from the, the passage. Okay. And it was, by the virtue of your own, do in fact constitute and things such as in just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, who, and then I skipped ahead, mm -hmm. who, who which we promise all due submissions and obedience. The passage, uh -huh. I believe, was point the point of view of the passage. Like, sorry. That's okay. The point of view of the passage, I believe, it was written in first person. I believe it was written mm -hmm. in first person. Sure. Mm -hmm. Due to the fact that the author portrays such loyalty and solitude to the king in starting out the colonies and the start of the patriotic tone, in a way. Stand Strands have found a lot through the text, with the author baking a lot of biblical aspects in his writing, like uh -huh. con constitution of the world, word faith. I believe that the reason for the word faith is due to the fact that, pe that people from the old world and are start sort of seeing the new world as a blessing due to the fact of the author committing to their submission and obedience. Okay. So yeah, I think yeah, you're, you're hitting on the same, a lot of the same language that Colby was. Um, so, <clears throat> I think that like you're kind of, the thoughts that you've got there are running in similar directions, which is why I'm kind of having trouble spinning something else off of that, right? Um, one thing I would kind of maybe direct all of you to do, right? So when they list the uh, titles of King James, right? Do you notice the way they list them? So what's, what's King James' full title here as listed? If we look, for example, at the end here, right? In the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th. It's King of England, France, Ireland, Scotland, right? Where was he not king of? 
What's that? I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is our king of the new world. Sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is an English colony, and they're acknowledging themselves as English subjects, right? But they're also, you know, there may be a sense in which they're kind of limiting the king's sphere of authority, right? It's like, these are the places where he's king. We're not in those places anymore. So it is thus okay for us to formulate our own body of laws. All right, Shaquille, what about you? What did you write? Okay, so the main thing you were picking up on is the religious language. And, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so, yeah, we've got, on the one hand, like, all of this legal language, right? This is what we agreed to do in this place. But, yeah, we noted from the beginning here the importance of a religious vision, right? An idea of place and a purpose that is very closely connected to their religious ideals. So, how does this differ from documents like the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence? Yeah. Yeah, well, what, what's, what's a lot less, well, what, well, one, what's, com what's largely missing from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the Bill of Rights? Yeah, they're, they're not gone, but they're muted, right? And they're much, mu mu they're much less Christian specific, right? I think, you know, the, um, what's the, the opening of the, like, the, the opening to the, they, they, re they reference, you know, you know, the creator, right? but not necessarily a specifically Christian creator, right? And the, um, the first amendments to the Bill of the first amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, guarantees um, free practice of religion, right? That no one will have to pay taxes to support a church that they don't attend. Um, so that is, in a way, kind of direct descendant from this Mayflower Compact language, right? where we can start our own we can make our own laws here that are separate from, you know, the kind of intertwining of church and state in England, right? Um, but yeah, um, there's a lot less specifically Christian language in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, um, though I can think of some politicians who would probably disagree with me about that. Um, but what else is, what's completely missing from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that we find all over the Mayflower Compact. Yeah, and the whole idea of submission to the king, right? I mean, the Declaration of Independence is all about, you know, all the, way that, you know, all the ways in which the king has shat upon us, right? It's a list of grievances against the British king and a demand that they be addressed, right? Or as by the time the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are written, we're dealing with an independent nation that no longer has a king, right? So we see, like, in, you know, in the course of about 160 years, or about a century and a half, um, people go from thinking of themselves as English, even if they're living in the New World, to thinking of themselves as something else, right? And this is just kind of like one way in which we, we can you kind of like reach back to that something else that people living in what they were calling the new world were before they thought of themselves as Americans, right? Okay, so any questions about any of this? And I do want to stress again, like, that, you know, for all four of you, like, there were definite ideas there in the free writing, right? They weren't organized or cohesive yet, but that's the whole point, right? You do the free write, right? You time yourself, and when you're done, 
you, do, you look and see what you've got and what you might be able to build on in that, right? Okay, so <clears throat> the big thing that I want to talk about today is the distinction between claim and evidence because that's what's going to help you with this next assignment. difference between a claim and evidence. Can anybody tell me or think you can tell me? And yeah, I think that's, that's pretty close to the way I want us to be using these terms, right? So when we talk about evidence, right, what we're talking about is statements that are objectively true. So we don't necessarily have to bring in here the relationship to a claim or an argument or an opinion yet, right? When we talk about evidence, think of like evidence is like data, right? You're looking at information that is on its own objectively true. So it's something that you could look up and verify, right? If you can look it up and verify, it's evidence. Now a claim then, if a statement, or if evidence is a statement that's objectively true that you can look up, then what must a claim be? Yeah, it's something that's not necessarily a verifiable fact, right? It's not something you could look up in a dictionary. Typically, like when we think when we think of a claim, right? The way I want you to think of it is this, right? A claim is an interpretation of evidence, right? It's a conclusion that you come to based on some set or pattern of facts, right? So it's like, okay, I've got this set of facts in front of me. This is what I think they mean, right? That's the claim. So <clears throat> the first step here before we start trying to make claims is to be able to recognize them in other people's writing. And then we'll talk a little bit about you know, maybe, you know, ways of evaluating claims, right? So <clears throat> if I give you something like this, right, this is a quote from uh, the British writer George Orwell. Um, he, it's from a book called The Road to Wigan Pier. It was written in the 1930s during the Depression. And he was traveling in the north of England checking out conditions in coal mining towns, right? So here's the quote. Right, sentence number one. Middle class people are fond of saying Miners would not wash themselves
even if they could. But this is nonsense. Second sentence. Where pithead bats, that is bats that are right in the mine pit, exist. Practically all the men use them. So which of these is a claim and which is evidence? Think about if there were any if there are any tell words in either of these, right? That give away what it is. Think about which of these you could ver you could conceivably verify. Okay, explain. Yeah, you could verify what, like, when, when mining companies provided bats, right? You could verify to see whether people actually use them or not, right? Now, what's another tell here that is in this first statement that should inform you that it's a claim? What's that? Yeah, the fact that at the end it says, but this is nonsense, right? Oh, that says miners. I mean, miners. I thought it said miners as in little kids. No, 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 no. Miners <laughs> as in people who work. People who work in mines. Yes. Okay. This is little, this is an e. That makes a little more sense. <laughs> yes. Now. This okay. is an e. Miners as in little like people under eighteen. That's that's that has an o in it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, but yeah, but, but this is nonsense, right? He's expressing an opinion about someone else's opinion, right? Their opinion is wrong because of this, right? We can check this out. Okay, let's try another one here. So this is from an essay on art history by the cultural theorist Walter Benjamin called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. All right, so number one here. Mechanical, mechanical reproduction of a work of art represents something new. Number two, the Greeks <coughs> knew only two procedures for technically reproducing works of art. Founding and stamping. All right, so which of these do you think is a verifiable fact, something you could look up, and which of these seems more like an interpretation of that fact? this up, right? You can verify whether or not the Greeks knew multiple procedures for technically reproducing works of art, right? Which means that number one is the claim because this is an interpretation, right? So if the ancient Greeks only knew 
these two new ways, right? These two ways, right? Founding and stamping both have to be done by hand. So mechanical reproduction of a work of art, right? This must be something that is new, right? Wasn't known to the ancients, but we know how to do it. This must be something new, right? Okay. So one more. This is from a book by the post-colonial theorist Frantz Fanon called Black Skin, White Masks, which is about the relationship between um, you know, colonizers and their colonized peoples. So Fanon writes, the colonized is elevated above his inferior social status in proportion to his adoption of the mother country's cultural standards. What kind of want to quickly say that um, if I was in the homework doghouse, I'd be doing a lot less chattering and giggling and a lot more paying attention, all right? I'm not deaf. Number two. In the French colonial army, the black officers serve, first of all, as interpreters. All right, again, which of these is something you could look up? The second one is something you could look up, right? If you had access to French colonial army records, right, you could look and see if this was, in fact, the job that was first assigned to most black officers, right? And yeah, the first one here is an interpretation of that fact. So does anybody have any questions about the relationship between claim and evidence, about how to recognize one or the other, and how they're related to each other? So, never mind. No, go ahead. OK, so basically, a claim is something that's like stated from a person or like from a text, right? And evidence is something that's actually like found true in words to form. Yeah, so um, evidence is basically anything that is objectively verifiably true, right? So it could be from any source, like, or does it have to be from like the internet? Or, like, it should be from it should be from a good source. It should be from a responsible source. Okay. Um, so um, I would not call much of what is on the internet good or responsible source. Um, you know, there are good and responsible sources on the internet, right? But there's a lot of shit out there, too. Um, so, one of the things that you need to be careful about is the kinds of sources that you use. So, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we're doing, when we're talking about research. Um, but that's something that we do need to be aware of, right? That the sources from which you're getting your information matter, right? Some sources, have particular political biases. Um, some sources are written by people who are basically cranks who are not respected in their field, right? So when y'all took comp one, um, did you go over the term ethos at all? Does this sound familiar? Okay, so Colby and Michaela, you guys are nodding. What's ethos? Can't remember? Last time I heard that one was in middle school. Okay. Okay, ring any bells for you, Colby? Isn't it like an uh, appeal to like your, uh, like your ethical sense, sort of? It has the same root word as ethics, right? So when we talk about like ethics as a branch of philosophy, or we're talking about 
you know, how you should behave, right? how you show you're of good character. And ethos essentially means character. So when we talk about ethos, what we are talking about is you know, the source's character and their authority, right? So when you are getting ready to cite any source, the first thing you should do is look that person up and make sure that they are someone who actually has the authority to speak on this topic, right? What are their credentials? Are they respected by other people in their field, or at least not openly derided by other people in their field, right? So the, this, this is really kind of like the best way to check up on a, a source, right? Check their credentials, make sure that they have ethos, right? Make sure they have authority to speak. And if you're looking at a source that's published anonymously, what should you do with that? Don't use it, yeah. If you can't find an author, right, if no one will put their name on it, you can't look that person up, don't use it. Okay, any other questions? So, when we're talking about this claim evidence relationship, there is an implied relationship between the claim and the piece of evidence that usually goes unstated, right? There's a reason why we draw a particular interpretation from a particular piece of evidence, right? So if we're looking at this example, why can we connect this claim to this piece of evidence? Think about what an interpreter is and what an interpreter does. What's an interpreter? Yeah, exactly. An interpreter is a translator, right? Now, when we think about officers in an army, right? What's the job we usually associate with an officer? What does an officer do? What's that? Protect. Well, do they, do they protect the other troops? Oh, you talking about like, okay. Yeah, in terms of like what their actual function is in the army, right? Yeah, they command troops basically, right? They command a unit, and you know that might you know be you know about ordering supplies, right? It might be about you know commanding in the field, right? Making sure they have everything they need. But yeah, the basic function of an officer in the army is to command troops, right? To command a unit of troops. So in Fanon's example here. Is this the job that the black officers are given? The job they're given is to translate for the white officers, right? So then what, how does he come to this conclusion based on this piece of evidence? What's the only way for a black officer to get ahead in the French colonial army? Well, for one thing, what does he have to have a good and thorough knowledge of if he's going to be a translator? Language, which language specifically? French. Oh. Army. <laughs> yes, he's got to have a strong command of French, right? Whatever his own native language would have been. So in order to move ahead in a, colonize, a society colonized by the French, right? A colonized person has to become really conversant with French language and French cultural codes, right? So that's the connection here between this claim and this piece of evidence. 
I'm going to give you a little bit simpler example that might help illustrate what I'm talking about. So, let's say I make the claim that I am a U.S. citizen. The evidence that I use to back this up is that I was born in Pennsylvania. Why can I make this claim based on this evidence? Yeah, Pennsylvania is part of the U.S., right? And legally, what does that mean? Yeah, anyone born on U.S. soil is a U.S. citizen, right? It's of the 14th Amendment. Right, so this connection between claim and evidence, we call a warrant, right? And you will often find that the warrants are unstated in other people's arguments, but when you're writing, I want you to give me this connection, right? I want to know how you get this claim from this piece of evidence, right? Because the big thing that I want to see from you is your thought process. I don't want to just see you get from A to C, I want you to give me B as well here, right? And so practice with enthymemes is one way that we can kind of start doing that, right? So to explain what an enthymeme is, I first have to explain something else to you. Have any of you ever heard the word syllogism before? It's totally okay if you haven't. I just you know, want to gauge what everybody's prior level of knowledge is here. Okay. So is what you're thinking of Michaela something like this? All humans are mortal. Socrates is human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Okay, a couple of you are nodding along. You've seen something like this before? Okay, so what a syllogism is, is a means for testing whether a proposition is logical or not, right? So we start with what we call our major premise, right? This is the general categorical statement we want to make, right? All humans are mortal, right? So we're talking about a whole category of things. Our minor premise is our application of this major premise to a specific case, right? So Socrates is human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's our conclusion, right? Now the subject of the major premise and the object of the minor premise have to be in agreement, in agreement or the syllogism doesn't work, right? So if we switch this up a little bit, if I say all humans, is, are, <laughs> all humans are mortal, Socrates is mortal, therefore Socrates is human, does it still work? Really? All humans are mortal, right? Did I say all mortals are human? 
So these terms match, but these two terms aren't supposed to match, right? It's supposed to be this term and this term that match. And then this term and this term that match. That's how you know it's logical. Now, a syllogism tests whether a proposition is logical or not, right? Is logic the same thing as truth? You're shaking your head no, Colby? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The fact that like, this doesn't test whether a statement is true or not, right? It just tests whether or not it makes logical sense. So I could say, for example, that all fish can swim. Colby is a fish. Swim, right now I can look at you and see that you are not a fish, right? I don't see gills anywhere, you are not in water, um, you know, or like in some kind of like suit apparatus that would keep you alive in an oxygen environment. Um, but yeah, um, logically this checks out, right? All the terms are in the right places, but we happen to know that the minor premise is not true. So the, the thing to be careful with, with this form of reasoning, right, is that something can be logical but still not be true. So all this tests for is whether or not something is logical. Now here's what this has to do with um, what I'm asking you to do for tomorrow night, right? So an enthymeme is a syllogism in which One or more premises are implied rather than directly spoken. And enthymemes are actually a lot more common than syllogisms are. You see enthymemes actually kind of all over um, our speech, all over movies, all over music, um, all over TV, right? All over advertising in particular. So to give you a relatively simple example here, Bigger burger is a better burger. This is our old Burger King ad. The burgers are bigger at Burger King, yes. What's the implied premise here? A bigger burger is a better burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King. Yeah. Essentially what they've done here is left off the conclusion, right? And let you come to it yourself. You are supposed to come to the conclusion that the burgers are better Good. All right. <clears throat> Let's try another one just to make sure everybody gets it. Um, this was a line spoken by the lawyer, Johnny Cochran, at O.J. Simpson's uh, murder trial. He said, if the glove doesn't fit, must acquit. What's he implying in this statement when he says, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit? Why must you acquit if the glove doesn't fit? Okay, yeah, the glove is a piece of evidence, right? 
And so, if the glove does not fit my client's hand, right? Well, the, yeah, that means that you can't you can't put them at the scene, right? So if this piece of if this glove if this piece of evidence was what were you were using to try to convict my client, and it doesn't fit him, it's not his glove. You can't put him at the scene. All right, good. Um, let's try one more here. Self-absorbed people. Don't give to charity. I know that you aren't self-absorbed. What's the implied premise here? What's the implied statement? God, can you say that a little bit louder? Yeah, that I know that you aren't self-absorbed, right? So you must give to charity, right? This sounds like a really aggressive pitch right, that somebody is giving, you know, door to door. It's like, you're not a self-absorbed person, right? You're gonna put money in my little box. Okay, so does everybody more or less get how this works? Okay, so I want you all to take maybe five minutes and see if you can come up with an enthymeme on your own, right? So think of this as practice for the homework assignment, right? See if you can come up with one of these on your own, right? So remember what you're doing essentially is writing a syllogism, but you're, but you're leaving one of these premises implied, right? The read, your, your reader or listener has to figure it out. doesn't take you five minutes to do this, then try to do another one.
I'll take one more minute. Okay, that's time. So what'd y'all come up with? Can everybody jump up at once? Okay. Yeah, Michaela, go ahead. Okay, so earlier I was working on this assignment and I was just running down a bunch of stories. And I also came across over the internet. Yeah, um, don't, I, I know all the ones that are on the internet, right? I've seen those before. Don't use those. I want you to actually do the work of finding them. But yeah, what have you got? I got a Pinterest board. Okay. And I have BTS artillery seekers after all they've eliminated from many communities. Okay, so what's the, impl what's, what's the implied premise there? What's the missing statement? Yeah it's, yeah, it's basically, again, just this syllogism pattern, right? Just with one sentence left out. All right, what are the rest of you got? I'm sorry, a little, little louder. You always speak a little too quietly. Okay. So what's, what do you, so what's implied then in that statement? All right. Who's next? Go ahead. Good material makes good clothing. The mm -hmm. material of clothes are better American Eagle. Okay. Implying thus. Um, the clothes are better American Eagle. Yep, American Eagle makes better clothes. Yep, all right, good. Colby, what about you? Uh, I came up with four. Okay, pick your best one. Uh, room and use old spice, you should too. <laughs> Okay, implying? Implying that you're only a real man if you use those books. Yes, all right, that, that's, yeah, a lot of advertising works this way, right? It le and notice how quickly, right, when I gave you that Burger King ad, how quickly your, all of your brains filled in what the missing statement was, right? This is one of the reasons why for this assignment, I want you to just locate three enthymemes in something you're reading, or something you're watching, or something you're listening to. Because these tend to just kind of go, like, we tend to just kind of absorb these automatically and not think much about them. Part of the point is to slow down and think about how the language actually works and to pull out the verbal implications of what you're listening to, right? To do that work that our brains usually just kind of do on autopilot, right? It's kind of part of that whole that larger process of slowing down and thinking a little bit more about language. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about anything um, at all? Yeah, Ariel. For the homework you said, I will give, sorry, this is, I just, I was reading the homework again. Yeah, yeah. It says, I will give you a sample paragraph to examine. Are you going to give us? Yeah, I'll email problem? you something when I get back to my office. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have something to work from. And again, like you, you know, I'm going to try to give you something that's not, you know, that's not as difficult as what I've been giving you. But 
in general, you should be able to um, tell what's a claim and what's evidence based on cues, even if you don't understand all of the words. I do also, I, I want, uh, you know, I am annoyed about the homework stuff, but I want to apologize for just how salty I was in the beginning of class. I have a toothache and it's driving me nuts. Um, and it's making me a little bit cranky. Um, so there we go. Uh, all right, so that is all I have for you today. So you may, uh, you may go. Um, remember to get this done by midnight tomorrow, right? And we'll see you on Thursday.